Hello and welcome everybody. Um, my name is Abigail Bernal. I'm a, an associate curator of Asian Art at Koikoma. You're watching a virtual talk held in conjunction with the 10th Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art, otherwise known as APT. I'm really pleased to be joined by Lee Pahe, who is an artist from the Philippines, and she's exhibiting two really extraordinary works in uh, APT 10, uh, paintings on copper, one is a three panel triptych titled The Stories That Weren't Told from 2019. Uh, it's approximately two and a half meters in height. And the second work was commissioned specifically for APT 10. And it's a 12 panel uh, suspended painting in a kind of semicircular panorama. Um, and it's titled Somewhere, Someday, When We Oversee from 2021. Uh, Lee, thank you so much for joining me today. Really lovely to have you here. <laughs> and, thank you too, um, Abby. I remember when we when we met in Manila in 2019, uh, you told me that your triptych, the stories that weren't told, was inspired by a mural that you'd seen uh, as a child when you were um, in hospital. Um, and can you say something about the mural and also the creation myth that it illustrated? Yeah, um, the mural is based on the Philippine creation myth called Simalakas at Simaganda. And the myth tells how the earth was created and how the first uh, man and the first woman were born out of a bamboo and that they got married and had many children from which the descendants of the earth came from. Um, in the mural, we see the first uh, man and the first woman stepping out of a bamboo and the name of the first man is Malakas, which means strong. And the name of uh, the first woman is Maganda, which means beautiful. Actually, these names, Malakas at Maganda, weren't at all present in the uh, early documentation of this pre-colonial myth. And the first man and the first woman were just described as the man and the woman. And strangely, in the mid 20th century, uh, these names were added and adapted in educational texts for decades. And this was even made popular when uh, the late dictator Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos commissioned a painting depicting them as Malakas at Maganda. And they used this myth as an image building propaganda. And it was dur also during their prolonged term in the government that they commissioned that same mural in that same hospital. So anyway, um, as a young child seeing this for the first time, I was fascinated by the imagery and the grand narrative of the creation myth. And I remember asking the nurse, what the myth is about. And she said, it's about the creation of the very first two people who were meant for each other. And that made an impression on me. And even at a young age, I felt that uh, it didn't fit how I see myself and the world around me. So what I did was I made up different kinds of stories about them, along with other stories like uh, the story of Adam and Eve. So while growing up, uh, I realized uh, how similar and yet nuanced the story of uh, Simalakas at Simaganda with the story of Adam and Eve. In Simalakas at Simaganda, they were both born at the same time and from the same bamboo. While in the story of Adam and Eve, Adam was created first and then Eve was created next using Adam's rib. And I guess this says a lot how these stories were framed from... Uh, but based from the social status of both sexes from these two different cultures. And I think uh, if we think about it based on Simalakas at Simaganda, we can say that pre-colonial Philippines regarded both man and woman in e on equal footing. And so these were some of, uh, these were some of my thoughts and recollections that inspire the creation of the stories that were told. It's really fascinating, Lee. I didn't know about that, um, that the name was applied so much later and the attributes yeah. of the men and women. Um, can you tell me something about the imagery and the context of the, um, I mean, I think we've covered the context a little bit, but can you tell, talk about the imagery in your triptych as well? Yeah. Uh, mm. The stories that were in told was a part of a group show called uh, Fathom, the Monumental in Art series, which was shown in Orange Project and in partnership with the Now Art Management and curated by Leo Abaya. This was in 2019. And in the group show, we were asked to create a large scale uh, work 
and to tackle the concept of monumentality beyond the physical size of the work. So for me, it was the monumentality of the creation myth and the memory of seeing that mural for the first time, which made an impact on me during my formative, formative years. So the work, uh, the stories that weren't told is uh, a retelling and mixing of tropes of these two stories, Si Malakas at Si Maganda and the story of Adam and Eve. And we will see uh, iconographies and symbolisms from both stories in this uh, one hybrid narrative. Symbolisms like the tree of knowledge, the apple, and bamboo were all taken out of its original context to create this new creation myth. And if we look at the painting, instead of seeing the tree of knowledge, uh, like in paintings uh, about Adam and Eve, we see the central image as the body of water or a lake. And with the lake, the bodies of the first human beings as water. Uh, water represents fluidity. And for me, gender is, gender is fluid. Identity is fluid and gender is like clothing or uh, skin that we can choose to wear or discard. And in this uh, Garden of Eden, in this, in this paradise, there is no first man or first woman, only first people. That's fascinating, yeah. It's such a beautiful work. Um, I think people are gonna love seeing it when it's in, installed and APT open. So. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so you also worked on another work for us, Lee, which you I talked to somewhere, someday, when we are the sea, um, which was especially created for APT 10. And it has uh, quite a strong relationship with your triptych that we've just been talking about, but takes quite a different form. Um, so what's your idea or your ideal of the work's relationship with the viewer and how do you see the two works relating to each other? Uh, somewhere, someday, when we are the sea is a continuation of what the stories that we're in told is about. And it takes a more three-dimensional form. It's, uh, it's an installation with 12 oil and copper panels form into a circular format. And the panels form a panor panoramic view of different topographies into one continuous landscape. And uh, the structure echo uh, a slitted bamboo, which is an image that can be found in the stories that weren't told. While these two works echo each other, there is a shift in the mode of looking from a passive to a more active way of viewing the viewers are asked to engage, to enter, and to go in and around of the installation, to take their time and to tra traverse the space. And through this installation, I wanted to utilize the body of the viewer as a thread that ties the two works together and their meaning as a whole. Yeah, and they'll be shown very close together too, won't they? Like the triptych is on the, on the wall and as you enter, into the installation, you'll be able to glance back and look at that and take both of them in at once, which is a really nice kind of juxtaposition of the two. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about the mysterious seascapes that these um, people are kind of vessels for? Um, when did they first come into your work and have they been a kind of ongoing and evolving motif in your, in your practice? Uh, actually, water was already present in my early works, though it hasn't taken the shape of a seascape or a, a wave, it's already there. And an early example is a video work called Sit in My Retina, which is a documentation, a video documentation of a day in the life. And we see the presence of water every day and how vital it is for, uh, to sustain our physical needs and as means for livelihood and transportation. Water is also a, a way of life for us Filipinos, and we see this in myths which resonate with the culture and the country as an archipelago. Uh, water is also an element in Simalakas at Simaganda, which uh, as a force of nature and as the sea that, creates the, that created the earth and the first human beings. And this imagery reminds me of uh, the primordial soup. So the seascape and the crashing waves first found its way in my, into my work called Shifting Center. Shifting Center is about uh, creation and going back to the beginning. And in this, another work called The Nth Wave, which is an exploration uh, on copper as a printing surface and as a sculptural form at the same time. 
And then this finally evolved into what I dub as the primordial people. And it was in the work birthing that I first rendered the human body as water. Uh, so these ideas, the, um, the seascape, the primordial people are ongoing ideas. And I'm still not yet sure if this will evolve or this will uh, continue to appear in my works. Mm-hmm. Um, when you were painting uh, somewhere, someday when we're the sea, um, you lost your mentor and dear friend, Professor Leo Abaya, um, who also was, you mentioned, um, curated uh, Fathom in Bangalore, where you, where you showed your triptych. Um, can you tell me a little bit about Professor Abaya and his role in encouraging you as an artist? Uh, Leo Abaya was, uh, has been my teacher and mentor ever since I went to university to study fine arts. And Leo Abaya was many things. He was a very brilliant artist whose broad range, uh, whose practice range from painting, sculpture, installation, and video. And he was also an award-winning production designer for Filipino movies like Muraami and Rizal, as well as in theater productions. And in 2013, his first written and directed film called Instant Mommy was released. Uh, Among these roles, his most influential was as a professor in the University of the Philippines College of Fine Arts. And he's known for this terrifying question. He he always asks students whenever they present their uh, idea or their concepts or their works, he would ask, so what, who cares? And this is just his way to challenge students to to think more deeply about their work and the whys of the work. And I think the way he teaches made a huge impact to a lot of students, including me. So for me, uh, what made him an effective uh, mentor was that he never lectured. Instead, whenever we talk or whenever we talk about, about concepts, whenever I ask him questions, he would just answer me back with a question. He would never really tell me the answer, but instead he'd help me think to find the answers on my own. And I think that's a good trait of a mentor. And aside from being brilliant, there are a number of things why I, uh, I admire him. Uh, there's excellence in the things he does. He has a wide curiosity about anything and uh, his thirst for knowledge is expansive and all of these things we see in his works and I'm always excited whenever he comes up with new works or uh, when he comes up with uh, a new solo show and I'm just grateful that I was able to help and be involved in some of his exhibitions and it's just uh, a shame that he left so early when he could have done so many great things especially in the field of art and Leo Bai will truly be missed by a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, no, he definitely left left everyone too early, didn't he? Still very young. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Lee, both of your works for APT10 um, are based on um, different kind of altarpiece forms. So the triptych and the polyptych, which is a multi kind of panel work. Um, and so why was it important to you to use these forms? Um, the altarpiece format is often used uh, to tell a narrative wherein uh, each panel tells a different story and when combined, there, there's an overarching theme. And it's the same with my work. Altar pieces were significant instruments for teaching and uh, teaching ideas and stories found in the Bible, especially during the medieval times when most people were illiterate. And the, the stories that these altar pieces hold are the norm. So as I'm retelling these stories, I wanted to use this format to include stories that are found outside the norm. And in a way, uh, this is my way to validate and empower these non-normative stories. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so you, you also work with a lot of different mediums, Lee, like um, I know you've used resin, relief, um, paper, wood, um, as well as copper, as we're seeing in the works in APT10. Um, and you've also used video, which you mentioned earlier. So do you have a preferred medium in your practice? 
actually, I do not have a preferred medium. And my practice started from uh, drawing, painting, sculpture, video. And then most recently, I explored public art installation in which I closely work with masons from my community to create this site-specific and interactive work called Pagpamulak, which means to blossom. As for sculpture, aside from using cold cast marble or resin, wood uh, or copper, I also use uh, chocolates as a medium. And two examples are uh, works called uh, Sanctus Cunus, which, which are liquor-filled chocolates uh, formed into a vulva. And the other one is a part of the work, Ang Historia ng Ating Mga Kasalanan, which means the story of our transgressions. These are apple-shaped chocolates uh, that accompany the oil and copper painting. And both edible sculptures were served during the duration of the exhibition. And as for painting, aside for uh, paper or canvas, I use copper. Uh, this is also the material that I use for the works in APT-10, as you mentioned. Um, from what I observed, um, whether I use two-dimensional or three-dimensional media, I tend to gravitate towards a combination of both, just like in uh, my paperworks or copper works. And up to now, I'm still exploring different materials to expand my artistic expression. Um, when did you first start using copper in particular and, and what led you to choose that as a support? Does it um, contribute uh, significantly to the meaning of the works? And is it, is it really hard to work with and very time consuming? Uh, my first encounter with copper as a medium was in 2011 when I made my first solo show called Matter Potestatem, which is Latin for Mother of Power. And uh, it referenced women archetypes from Philippine and Western myths. Uh, and the show basically is about valorizing these women archetypes. So while I was conceptualizing this show, I went to visit the Ayala Museum and there I saw these two oil and copper paintings of saints done by a 19th century Filipino Chinese artist who lived in Manila. And his name is Damian Domingo. And I was inspired how he represented the saints and given them more value by painting them on copper. So I thought, why not, why not um, paint the women archetypes like how these saints were represented in, in these religious paintings. And what led me to use copper has something to do more about the, its value in the history of painting. During the medieval times, copper is one of the materials that's uh, being used uh, to create religious artworks. And conceptually, it fits what I wanted to create in my works. Uh, in terms of uh, copper, in terms of um, uh, create, uh, using copper as a medium, it's time consuming, definitely. And there are a number of things that I need to think about to be able to paint on copper. And based on research, um, uh, the most important part is to create a surface, a rough surface or, a, or teeth where the paint could adhere. And copper, was used since uh, copper as a was used as a surface, a painting surface since the 16th century. So, and there there are still so much to learn about the, this material, and up to now, I'm still exploring it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, we have one oil on copper painting in the Quagrama collection, and um, our conservators are really fascinated with it. So they're going to be very happy to to have your two new works in our collection to study in more depth as well. Um, I'm just wondering, going back to the, the idea of, of women that you've been exploring in your practice for, for a very long time, so women as archetypes and, and stereotypes as well as real women, women from creation myths. Um, so how influential is the idea of Eva or Maganda um, for contemporary Filipina women? And how, how accepting is society in general of um, of same-sex relations um, and the LGBTQ plus community in general? Um, the ideals of Eve and Maganda 
were deeply rooted in the psyche of most Filipinos, especially uh, the older generation, because uh, we've been colonized for so long, for over 300 years. And these ideals were reinforced time and time again through religion, education, and even in media. And although women empowerment has come a long way in our country, uh, there are still values uh, and roles being expected of women, like getting married, having kids, and being a doting wife. And even the idea of an ideal woman is uh, exemplified by beauty and femininity. And we see this every day in uh, movies, on TV, even on social media. And up to now, we'd, sti we'd still hear offhanded comments made by uh, celebrities or politician, uh, politicians of how a woman should or shouldn't be. And uh, despite that the Philippines ranks 16th in the World Gender Parity Index and is currently top in Asia, uh, there are still areas in society that does not uh, favor women, especially in terms of uh, economic participation and opportunities. And stories about we women being uh, harassed, uh, bullied, and discriminated against are still there. It's still rampant. Um, with regards to the society's attitudes towards the LGBTQ plus community and uh, the same sex relations. Uh, from how I see now, uh, Filipinos are tolerant but not accepting, especially in settings like the school or the workplace, bullying and discrimination based on gender and sexual orientation is still there. And it is most challenging for trans men, trans men, trans women, or those who are gender non-conforming to be in these settings that impose rigid uh, gender norms, like uh, participating in gendered activities, uh, wearing gendered uniforms, or the presence of uh, gendered comfort rooms. And uh, although the Philippines is regarded as one of the most gay-friendly countries in Asia, it uh, it's still far behind in terms of equality and protection of the LGBTQ plus community. There is no, uh, no, no national law in place. There is a lack of uh, public safe spaces and the SOGI equality bill is still not being passed. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure um, Australia is probably in a similar situation with lots of others those kind of gender roles as well. Um, just, um, you've, you've described stories as quite formative for your practice, Lee, and um, for AP10, you're referencing creation stories. Um, so what kind of other stories have, uh, have appeared in your work? Um, yeah, uh, I, yes, um, stories are formative because stories are compelling. And I believe stories are important part of our lives because it greatly influences how uh, we see ourselves, how we see others, how we see the world around us. And I always ask these questions, what stories are we told? What stories uh, do they tell about us? What stories do we tell ourselves? And so uh, I reference different kinds of stories in my works. Um, I've referenced Philippine and uh, Philippine myths, even, bibli uh, even biblical characters. And an example is a work called Blessed is the Fruit of Thy Womb, which is an oil on copper painting. It's a hybrid of Mother Mary and the Philippine goddess for fer fertility and harvest called Ikapati. And this was part of the show, Mater Potestatem, which I mentioned earlier. Also, I've referenced fairy tales in some of my works. And an example is Alien, Alien, the, the Crusade of General Bigote. And in this work, we see Disney characters running for their lives as an alien ship invades the town and abducts Aladdin and Jafar while they are on a magic carpet ride. And the alien ship is a reference from a Japanese animation show I used to watch as a kid, and it's called Voltes Five. And then there are works that references stories from real life. An example is a video work uh, titled A Portrait of May Paner, 
May Paner is a performing artist and a political activist known for her alter ego, known as Wanna Change. And Wanna Change criticizes political uh, um, issues in the Philippines. And so I asked May to wear this contraption I made. It's a helmet that serves as a cradle for my handicam. And back then, action cameras weren't as accessible and mobile phones weren't, weren't as advanced. So I had to devise my way, uh, a way to, shot, to shoot in the first person point of view. So we shot snippets of our day from waking up until uh, sleeping. And if you get to watch this video, it would give you an illusion that you are inside her head, uh, watching her every move as she goes on with her day. So these are just some of the stories uh, that I've referenced in my works. Um, so would you say that challenging ideas of gender specificity is a central focus for your work, along with um, the destabilizing of, of gendered iconography? Um, the, these works were made in hope of retelling stories to include people who are not usually represented in normative stories like creation myths. And the main focus really is to create avenues or alternatives where no marginalized people could see themselves in. So uh, challenging ideas of gender specificity and destabilizing gendered iconographies come as a result rather than as a focus. So you're, you're creating a, a kind of a space for people to enter and feel feel at home and feel safe and somewhere they belong, aren't you, with this, with this um, new work that we've commissioned for APT10. Would you, would you say that was true? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, we might finish there, Lee, because I think that's a really nice way to, to end um, for the interview. But thank you so much for joining me and for talking so beautifully about your work. It's, thank it's you been, to Abby. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to have you involved in the exhibition. Thank you for having me here.